I appreciate everybody being here and thanks for the school for hosting us. We are joined, we're going to do a, a bi great bill signing today, and we're joined for that with our Commissioner of Education in Florida, Manny Diaz. We also have the Executive Director of Jacksonville Classical School, Lindsay Hoyt. Uh, Ruth Poe, mother of three and kindergarten teacher, is going to talk uh, about her experience with classical education. Chancellor of the State University System of Florida, Ray Rodriguez. Uh, Senator Clay Yarborough from here in Jacksonville, as well as Representative Kion Michaels from here in Jacksonville. So I want to thank all of them for being here and uh, the legislators in particular for helping get this bill across the finish line. Uh, today, we're building off the success that we've had in education with really uh, a potpourri of education reforms packed in one bill. Uh, HB 1285 uh, has a number of really, really beneficial items. I'll talk a little bit about those in a second, but it really builds off the success that we've had uh, across the board when it comes to education. First, uh, we're one of the leading states in protecting the rights of parents to be directing the education and upbringing of their children. And we signed a Parents' Bill of Rights many years ago. We've also enacted things like the Parents' Rights in Education, as well as curriculum transparency uh, for parents so that they know what is being taught in their kids' schools. We've advocated and advanced civics education throughout the state of Florida. We now have every school district in Florida participates in our civics and debate initiative. I think there were less than a dozen schools that were participating just five years ago. And we also launched the Civic Seal of Excellence program for teachers. So they go through the program, 50 hours of, of, of training on things that quite frankly, any civics teacher should have, but most universities in this country, uh, unfortunately, do not touch any of these key subjects about how America was founded, what are the principles that underlie our Constitution and Bill of Rights. So they go through that and they get a $3,000 bonus. And so we've put through a lot of teachers with that. We're continuing that program and that's something that's very, very beneficial. Uh, we've also increased teacher salaries every year uh, since I've been governor. We are now have in this budget that I'm gonna be signing probably within the next month or two. Uh, the biggest increase in teacher compensation. And that's not just for school districts, that also is for our public charter school uh, teachers as well. So, so we're proud to do that. We're also proud to be the nation's leader in education, freedom, and school choice. And we started back in 2019 when we created the Family Empowerment Scholarship, uh, and we continue to expand that so that now today, uh, Florida has universal parental choice when it comes to education. So it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter your income, you have meaningful choices about choosing the best school for your kids uh, and for your family. And that obviously has been a proven record of success because we do much better in education than we did in the past and choice is a big part of that. We also were proud to, and I know they did really well here in Jacksonville, when all these kids lock, got locked out of school during COVID for a year or more, uh, we were uh, having kids in school and particularly here, they had normal school. I came during this time period uh, and it was normal. And that's a huge, huge benefit to these kids and those that were locked out for a, a year, that is uh, gonna have lasting impact. Uh, some of the draconian measures that were taken, even in some of the schools that were open, were not conducive to learning. So I'm proud that Florida led the way, and particularly here with uh, Jacksonville Classical School, how they really handled this in a way that was um, not based on, on hysteria, but based on what was best for the students. And that's had a meaningful difference for that. So we're excited about all the progress uh, that we've had. Uh, we are, if you look at our university system, we're number one in lowest tuition and fees of all 50 states as an in-state resident. You can go for the same tuition today than, than, than it cost 10 years ago. Imagine that. Uh, there's not anything that's less expensive or the same price except in-state tuition in Florida education, every, everything else. Well, that's something we control. So we just said, you know what? 
we don't need you uh, raising tuition just to hire more bureaucrats to work at your universities. We'd rather it be affordable for students and then we'll do that. So we've done that and really held the line and that's why we're the most affordable. Uh, we're number two in two-year graduation rates and number four in four-year college graduation rates. And you know, part of the reason why you're able to get people through in four years is because we're not charging an arm and a leg. We're not trying to keep them for six years just to make more money off that. We want you to go get, get, your, get your degree um, and then move on. And then, of course, of our universities, you know, we've led the way on making sure they're not going to be cauldrons of ideological indoctrination. We're focusing on core subjects and things that really uh, is the classical mission of a university, just as we're here at a classical school uh, in the K through 12 realm. So we have a lot uh, to be proud of, but we don't stop and we don't rest on our laurels. So today, and momentarily after we hear from some of the speakers, I'll be signing House Bill 1285. So this has a huge number of things that are gonna really make a difference. One, uh, we really believe in supporting military families when it comes to our school system, and we believe in creating pathways for students who may want to go into the military as a career. So this bill requires that school districts and charter schools provide 11th and 12th grade students with the opportunity to take the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, the ABSVAD, um, and the ability to consult with a military recruiter. Recruiting is actually down in the military. I think that's a lot because of some of the uh, political leadership that, that we have directing this. Uh, that, that needs to be corrected, uh, but in the same time, we want to do our part to make sure folks have opportunities for meaningful careers. The other thing that we're doing in this bill is Florida started a Purple Star School program where schools that offer certain resources for children of military members can qualify for this purple star. It's a, there's somebody to consult with, uh, people that understand the, the transferring when you have to move to every two to three years because of PCS. So there's a number of things that are unique to this that helps integrate children of military members into the school communities. So what this bill does is it, is it wants to encourage that so that in any individual school district, if 75% of the schools qualify as purple star campuses, then the whole school district can become a Purple Star school district. And that will be very beneficial for a lot of military families and it builds off the success that we've had uh, with that program. Another thing this bill does is it tackles some issues related to higher education. And, and one of these provisions is, is kind of uh, it resonated with me because um, I had to work my way through school. So I was working jobs uh, when I was going through uh, for whatever reason, there were some programs in our university system that prohibited the students from working part-time job if they want to. Didn't require, no one's required to work. I mean, you've got to make those decisions. But it actually prohibited that. So this bill repeals that rule. It allows students to be able to work their way through. You're much better off doing a part-time job and paying your own way than going deeper into debt. So we should not want to forestall that opportunity for folks. And as somebody that's been there and done that, uh, I think it's ridiculous that we would have said you're not permitted to work in some of these programs. I mean, I remember when I got to, uh, to law school, I had done, I was a baseball player all through college. I was working jobs. Uh, as well, and I was doing schoolwork, so so I was very busy. I get to law school, and they're like, "Oh, it's so tough. Like you, Harvard Law School is like the the big. You 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 can't. You just have to. You can't work. You can't do." So here I am. I'm not an athlete anymore, uh, and I wasn't working for the first time in a long time. So all I'm doing is going to be a a, a first year law student. And I never had so much time on my hands in my life. It was boring. And I'm sitting there, okay, you know, you have all this. So I immediately, after a few months of that, you know, got some jobs and started making money to be able to put my way through. So uh, we, we want people to be able to do that. I don't think there's any program that you couldn't work uh, at all 
and be a part of. I just don't buy that. I think that that's nonsense. So, so this corrects that, which I think is really, really important. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're reforming uh, our boards of trustees. So we have trustees at these universities. We have the Board of Governors. Uh, we are not going to allow uh, a post-secondary institution's board of trustees from conducting private business with the institution with which they are a member. And otherwise, in other words, you don't want a trustee hot wiring in business deals that will benefit the trustee uh, that's being done kind of, you know, a little bit under, underhanded uh, with that. So I think that that's a positive reform to do, and I don't think we should have trustees that are, that are actively profiting from it. It's a public service, and we have a lot of great people that have raised their hand to serve in our university system, and we're proud of that. We want to make sure that that's clear. Now, some of the things that are more germane to where we are today at Jacksonville Classical Academy. So classical education is really booming, and it's something that is, uh, you know, to me as, as a policymaker, I look at it, uh, I think it's something that's very beneficial. I think that moving away from that over many decades is part of the reason why our education system in this country isn't as good uh, as it should be. And in some places, it's very poor uh, because classical really focuses on the, the basics uh, of what it means to be somebody who's a, a citizen of the United States, who's a citizen in the Western tradition, and who really learns how to think along the lines similar to how our founding fathers were educated. I mean, this is not something that is, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's a good way to do this. There's proven ways. And classical, I think, really recaptures what's been lost in some of the political mumbo jumbo that we've seen over many decades infiltrate our universities and our K through 12 school system. So we authorized last year the use of something called the classical learning test. So it's a standardized test. It's uh, a classical version of the SAT or the ACT, and so you can do the classical test, and that could be a basis for admission to universities in the state of Florida, and the usage rate in the past school year for the classical learning test increased by 4,000% throughout the state of Florida. So part of it is we just want students to have more opportunities. Part of it is some of these entrenched testing companies, like the College Board, you know, they have a certain way of doing things. I think they've gone off on tangents on some stuff. So if that's not your cup of tea, you got the classical learning test if that's what you want to do, which is really, really good. We also are looking at making sure that teachers are equipped to be teaching in classical schools if they want to, because this is really being driven as much as as a policymaker I support it but it's really being driven by parents who are seeking out classical education parents that want to come here you guys you have a waiting list here every grade has a waiting list here see I didn't even know the answer to that but I figured they had a waiting list because parents are interested in this and they really are gravitating towards classical learning so in order to do that you got to make sure you have the teachers that are equipped so this bill uh, provides an ability for the State Board of Education to develop a classical teaching certificate. So that'll be something that if somebody earns this, maybe like a classical school in Naples, uh, the teacher has to come to Northeast Florida and wants to apply for a job, they have a t teaching certificate right here at the academy, you know that that's somebody that has the training and the way you're trying to, to educate the kids. So I think it's gonna be really, really good. I think the preparation for teaching at a classical school is different. Certainly, it's superior to what a lot of these schools of education are doing. I mean, some of these schools of education, it's, uh, it's basically all ideology. And, and that's, that's empty calories when it comes to education. That is not ultimately gonna produce really strong performance or strong students. The classical really gives a foundation that students can carry with them for their entire lives. Uh, the bill also makes it easier for families who are moving from one classical school to another to get admitted. So when you have something like a charter school, it's open enrollment, which it should be. I mean, it is a public school. But you also have, if somebody is in classical, maybe their family moves uh, to a different part of the state, wants to do classical. We really want to give them a pathway to continue that model of education. And this bill does that. 
and I think it's something that's really, really positive. Another thing this bill does, and we're not, we, we've got, I mean, this is, this is very big in and of itself. All school boards are now required uh, to negotiate uh, with F, our state college institutions to offer dual enrollment courses in their school district. So we're very supportive of kids earning college credit when they're in high school. There's different ways you can do that. You can do uh, advanced placement, inter international baccalaureate. You can do, uh, what's the other one There's um, that we do? Man, the ACE, yeah, well, you can do ACE. And, and in Florida, you can do this dual enrollment. So you do that. All Florida institutions recognize that as credit. And when people do dual enrollment, a lot of times they can get a four-year degree uh, two years out of high school even because they have so many credits that they've been able to build up. So we think that's something that's positive. Now, it's interesting, not all universities accept all of the uh, advanced placement. Not all universities accept some of the other tests, although I think most of them accept IB because I think it's pretty strong. But here, if you're doing dual enrollment, if dual enrollment's offered and you're going to go to school in Florida after high school, you rack up those credits uh, and you just do it. And then you're going to be able to, to, to graduate quicker than you otherwise would. So, so I'm a big supporter of that. I think we've seen, it's interesting, um, we've seen uh, increases in IB, definitely a big increase in ACE. I think more people have moved away from AP into some of those other ones, which are very high quality. Um, and you do, and ACE is Cambridge, is that, it's from Cambridge, so you have that, and then the dual enrollment is, is going to increase as a result of this bill. So, so that's very positive. Turnaround schools, so we were in Pensacola yesterday to highlight this provision of the bill. So Florida has something called turnaround status. Uh, if you are two consecutive years D or F grades, you're designated for turnaround status, the school district has to take corrective action. Maybe they bring in uh, somebody to, to oversee the school, to try to fix what's broken. Maybe they uh, uh, delegate it to a charter operator to turn it into a charter school. Maybe they just close the school because it's not something that's gonna work, but you have to take action. You can't just let these kids languish in F-rated schools. So that's the law. Now what's happened over the years is uh, not, and this happened in Pensacola in Escambia County. We had this, we had Warrington, Warrington Elementary School, uh, not, not, not doing well, uh, perennially very low graded. And so they took forever to be able to get the charter operator to take over. So we now have that, Charter Schools USA has, has taken it over, but it took years and years. They dragged their feet. The State Board of Education had to bring it in front of the State Board. There was this, there was that. And finally, when the school board was threatened with having their salaries withheld, they finally acted and did this. Well, we don't, we don't have that kind of time. If you are not, if you're in a school that's getting F grades, uh, we can't be satisfied with that. We have to do something about it. That's what the law requires. So this requires prompt action with turnaround schools. If the district wants to remediate with the tools that are provided in law to do it, they have every right to do that. Uh, I think a lot of times bringing in an outside operator like a charter school probably is going to be more effective. Clearly, that's been more effective in Pensacola when, we're, when we were at Warrington. I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, but you got to do something. You can't just language. You can't just drag your feet. Uh, we do believe in Florida that everybody can succeed. Uh, I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. Uh, you can succeed, but it's our responsibility to, to provide the tools necessary for success. And that means if a school's failing, uh, we have to act. And so the turnaround schools, we you know, hope to not have uh, a lot, but, but, but we have turnaround schools. Uh, action is going to be taken very quickly, and that's important. And then the final provision is something that is uh, unfortunately necessary. So we have curriculum transparency in Florida. We've empowered parents uh, to raise a red flag when you've had material that's not age or developmentally appropriate. And unfortunately, you do have sexually explicit materials that have been injected into schools, school districts throughout the country, including some in the state of Florida. And I think as a parent, 
uh, you should be able to send your kid to school without having that injected in their curriculum or, or put in the libraries. It's just not appropriate. A lot of the stuff that's sexually explicit, when parents will raise, raise it with a school board in a public meeting, when they will show pictures, when they will quote, the school board members usually will say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. It's, it's, it's too graphic for, for a public school board meeting. Okay, well, it's too graphic for that, but somehow you're going to jam it in front of a sixth grader? How does that work? The media will not pl uh, put some of these, these photos and some of the stuff on on, on TV because they would run afoul of some of the, uh, the decency uh, uh, restrictions that, that, you, that you run for being a public broadcaster. So there's all these things that's like, okay, if it's, if it's too explicit, sexually explicit for the six o'clock news, you're gonna put it in front of a fifth grader? No, you're not gonna do that. So, so that's unfortunately necessary to be able to give parents the ability to raise the red flag. Um, I think what's happened though is you have some people who are taking the curriculum transparency and they're trying to weaponize that for political purposes. And so that involves objecting to normal books like some of the books that I saw in the teacher's lounge, these classic books, there's people that will try to object to that because they want to create a narrative that's like, oh, all these books, you know, we don't know what, what's, what's lawful or, or not to have. That's nonsense. Um, all those books uh, that have been in schools uh, none of that has any impact. Our Florida law has no impact on any of that. Everybody knows that, but it's kind of a passive-aggressive posture to try to create conflict, to try to generate narrative, and to advance a political agenda. So we are ensuring through this legislation, look, a parent, you have kids in school, you want to go and, and, and raise these objections, you know, you have, you're empowered to do that. Community members who don't have kids in school some say, well, why should they be able to, to get involved in this curriculum? They don't have kids in school. Well, you know, they're, a lot of this, some of them pay taxes. Some of them uh, help support the schools through that. So I wouldn't say that someone that doesn't have kids in school has no interest. I mean, these are important institutions in our community. So they're still allowed to lodge objections, but you can lodge one a month because we're not going to create a cottage industry of people that are just trying to use this to advance themselves or to advance a, a false political narrative. And, and I think the legislature struck an appropriate balance. Now, Manny and the Department of Education, they're gonna be holding any principals or teachers accountable who are weaponizing this. So for example, there was a teacher in, uh, I think, Sarasota, Bradenton area that papered over every book in the classroom saying, oh, I, I, you can't have books. The state's not letting me show you books. That's a lie, that's not true, that's performative. And so that's somebody who's entrusted to teach kids putting their political agenda over the best interests of the students' education and their access to learning. That's wrong, so that's not gonna stand in the state of Florida. So we don't have time for your activism, we don't have time for your nonsense. Uh, we have a process in place to empower parents uh, unfortunately, it's necessary given what's been going on in our, in our uh, country, including even here in Florida, uh, but the notion that that would cause um, some question about whether some of these classic works of literature or things uh, is, is absurd. And we know that, so this puts the kibosh on that. We're not gonna sit there and indulge those frivolous complaints. So all in all, that's a lot of stuff for one piece of legislation. I think it's gonna be very, very positive, and uh, we're just gonna continue uh, to lead the way. I mean, we talked about some of the things that we've al already done. We've done a lot more in higher education than I even mentioned here. And uh, of course, we've done even more for parents than I was able to mention here. So we're gonna keep the ball rolling. This piece of legislation does that. And in a few minutes, it will be official. But before I make it official, I'm gonna invite up some folks. So we'll start with our education commissioner, Manny Diaz. Thank you, Governor. It's great to be in uh, Jackson Hill, Jacksonville to celebrate uh, classical education here. As, as the Governor men, men, uh, mentioned, under his leadership, Florida's ranked number one overall in education uh, by U.S. News and World Report, also ranked number one in power, parent power, educational freedom, and more as these measures continue to come out all of these things that you heard the governor mention and many other things that have been accomplished under his administration 
go into this. Uh, a reason for part of our success, part of the reason for our success is educational choice. And it's so important to highlight and be cognizant of the fact that classical education is part of that landscape. Um, and some of the things that we're doing here in this bill today are to enhance that uh, and provide some flexibility. Also, and the governor talked about uh, the, the advanced course options, I, I really want to highlight that, that dual enrollment piece because as the governor covered, you have ACE, you have IB, you have all the college board, you have the other ones. But when you, in Florida, when you take general education courses in dual enrollment, and we have a state course numbering system, and so every course that the student passes, if they stay here in Florida, if they go to our state university or a state college or even private institutions which are part of that uh, course numbering system, those, those courses are accepted. So there's no more of this, you know, you took that course in high school but it doesn't count. So you have a lot of students in Florida coming out of high school with their associate's degree and think about the already low tuition, think about the amount of money that parents and students are saving in Florida with these options and we are continuing to advance and, and try to create more of those accelerated opportunities that are Florida based and so it's important for our students but it's important to highlight that. Uh, going into the classical model as, as we sit here in this fantastic classical school today, uh, we talk about the enrollment preference. Why is that important? The governor mentioned when a student moves from one part to, of the state to another and they want to continue that classical education, it is important that they have that, that ability to have enrollment preference. As all of you here know, the classical model is very different and it's not only the ability to get teachers trained correctly or find the right teachers, but also getting the families and the students in that rhythm of understanding that this education is different. It's actually going back to our, our founding uh, um, impetus for education and getting to that core and having students who um, have those classic virtues and you know you go through those three stages grammar logic and rhetoric you build the foundation right of grammar uh, you go through logic and then as they get older they go into that rhetoric to express themselves so that enrollment preference is going to allow students to move from one classical school to another we also have a couple of other um, enrollment preference items here in this bill where we've, we've had our, our charter schools have evolved. And so now you have uh, entities that are donating land and partnering with charters. And a lot of them have our employment base. In other words, you have these huge business developments where a lot of employees come to a place, whether it be an airport or, or large industrial. And those parents sometimes in parts of our state have to drive a long way to get to work. And so we've created an enrollment preference that if those entities partner with a charter and they're bringing them in and make an investment to bring that charter there, we're going to be able to give preference to those employees to have their children close by or in the same location uh, as uh, where they work, which is an incredible tool for parents because you, you know in the morning when you're trying to get kids to school and then get to work, it becomes difficult. So that's going to incentivize more partnerships uh, when it comes to that and that's going to make a huge difference for families. When we talk about the teaching certificate, it is so important, and this is a, a long time coming, and I know folks here uh, worked on that with us. It, a classical teacher and a classical model is just different. And so in Florida, one size doesn't fit all. Thanks to the governor, we have the teacher apprenticeship models. We have the military pathways. We have all of those different pathways to reach certification. But we have such a growth in the classical space, and those classical uh, teachers have to be different. And so we want to be able to uh, have certification for those uh, teachers that are going into a classical model where the most important piece is, yes, they have a license, but what is the professional development attached to that? We don't want that to be a cookie cutter professional development requirement that districts do because classical uh, schools do it very differently. And so this is going to allow us to pass a rule with the state board to create the certificate and to work with the classical schools to create that professional development of what are the needs that that teacher really needs to have an impact in that classroom. So that, that teaching certificate makes a lot of sense uh, and that's, that's going to create um, more and more momentum for the classical movement in Florida. We've seen a lot of it. We've seen a lot of it here in Jacksonville and across the state. And this is going to allow us uh, to, to be able to enhance 
that teacher recruitment and that teacher development. So there's, there's a lot of exciting things uh, in, in this bill. And as the governor mentioned, there's a, it's a long track record in, in Governor DeSantis' administration of getting things done in education. And that's why we are ranked at the top of each one of these measures. And that's why we have so many options for parents here in the state. So thank you, Governor, for your leadership. And it's great to be here today for this bill signing. Morning, Jacksonville. Governor, I just want to commend you for your leadership, particularly in higher education. And I want to expand on one of the points you made in this bill. This is a comprehensive bill that touches K through 12 and post-secondary education. But one of the things the governor said is very important, and I want to highlight that. This bill will prohibit universities and colleges from having programs that will prohibit students from working while they're enrolled. Now, some of these the start, started outside of Florida, and what we see is like a cancer. These things start elsewhere, and they spread it spread into Florida as well, where you have these programs that believe our program, as, he, uh, as the governor commented, was his experience at Harvard, is so difficult that there's no way a student can do well in our program unless they're 100 percent completely focused only on our academic program. So in order to ensure that we have the students that can do this, we're not going to allow students in who can work. Well, prohibiting students from working doesn't make your program elite. What it does is it takes students who are not wealthy and it drives them into debt. And that's why if you look across this nation, in 2000, the outstanding student loan debt in this nation was $200 billion. Today, that number is $1.6 trillion. Why? Because other states haven't had the leadership that we have in Florida under Governor DeSantis, where there is a commitment to keep higher education affordable and accessible. So by prohibiting universities and programs from allowing students to work, we're saying that is not the case in Florida. In Florida, students will be allowed to work their way through school. And because we've had the leadership of the governor holding the line on tuition, to my knowledge, Florida may be the only state in the nation where a student can, in their spring semester, spend summer working full time at a minimum wage job and at the conclusion of summer have earned enough money to pay for their tuition and fees in Florida for the following fall and spring semesters. You can do that in this state because of our leadership and because of legislation like this bill here. So thanks for your leadership, Governor. This is going to continue to help keep higher education affordable and accessible for our students here in Florida. Thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. It is my distinct honor and privilege to stand before you today on this very momentous occasion as we gather to witness this incredible, crucial legislation at Jacksonville Classical Academy. On behalf of Chairman John Rood, all of our wonderful board members, our entire faculty and staff, parents and students, I want to extend a very well, warm welcome to our great governor, Ron DeSantis. So thank you so much for being here. This legislation provides a certification process tailored to the classical curriculum. So this will enable our teachers to get training, which is germane specifically to the classical model. This legislation also, which was mentioned before, uh, gives enrollment preference to the students that are transferring from one classical school to another, to a school like Jacksonville Classical Academy, allowing students that, that have already come up in the classical model um, to continue that. I'm a mom of two daughters who are right now, at this very second, um, being classically educated. So this is personal to me. I'm reminded that classical education is traditional American education. It started with the Greeks and the Romans, and like the governor mentions, it's nothing that we have made up. It's nothing newfangled. Our, sub our students learn what is true, what is good, what is beautiful in every single subject. And we don't teach kids what to think. We teach them how to think for themselves. So finally, I'm reminded that classical education, in my opinion, is the last way that we save the republic. Because what we're doing now is we're graduating free-thinking people, virtuous Americans, who are going to go out and lead the next generation of patriots to save the country. 
So this legislation is crucial to not only further the classical uh, movement in this country and in the state, but also um, our mission personally here at Jacksonville Classical Academy. So Governor DeSantis, we are honored to have you here today. Uh, we are beyond excited about what this legislation is going to do for our school and other classical schools. So thank you, Governor, for your leadership, your tenacity, um, your willing, unwavering commitment um, to education in the state of Florida and classical education. So thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Ruth Poe, and I'm a kindergarten teacher here at Jacksonville Classical Academy. I'm a mom of three children who are in fourth grade, first grade, and pre-K. When my oldest child was in pre-K, I was determined to make the best educational choice for him. I knew that I wanted him to be challenged at school and continue to develop his love of learning. I was drawn to classical education because of its content-rich curriculum and emphasis on virtuous learning. At the time, there weren't any classical charter schools in Jacksonville, so I homeschooled him using a classical model for kindergarten. When Jacksonville Classical opened in 2020, he began first grade and thrived at this school. Jacksonville Classical Academy is different than traditional public schools in many ways. The school offers a content-rich curriculum, including the study of the great books of literature. It also views technology as a tool to be used with intentionality, and there is not a reliance on laptops by students in this school. It focuses on teacher-led instruction and also emphasizes shaping both the hearts and minds of students. One final aspect that makes this school unique is that we are cross-curricular. If we're learning about a certain topic in history, students may also learn about music or art from that same time period. All of these characteristics are why I knew that I wanted my children to attend this school. I now have the privilege of teaching kindergarten at Jacksonville Classical Academy. I have always valued education and wanted to make a difference in the lives of students. I stepped into the field of education determined to provide other students with the excellent education that I wanted for my own children. My favorite part about teaching kindergarten is teaching students to read. At Jacksonville Classical, we teach explicit phonics using a spell to read program. The students learn spelling rules and sounds that letters make, which will enable them to learn to read any word that is put in front of them. I think it is such a gift to give young students this ability, and it will serve them well for their whole lives. HB 1285 will provide a pathway for teachers to pursue a classical education teaching certificate. I'm grateful to the governor and legislature for their support of this bill. I'm hopeful that this bill will help to attract quality teachers to teach in classical schools. As a parent, I wanted the best for my children, which led me to choose classical education for them. As an educator, I am able to provide an excellent education for my students by helping to build a framework for them to learn for the rest of their lives. In teaching them how to read, I am supporting them in a skill that will allow them to succeed in all academic areas. In teaching them virtues, I am laying the foundation for them to be good citizens in our society. I want to instill a lifelong love of learning in my scholars, and it's a joy to teach them. It is such important work, and I'm grateful to the governor and legislature for their support of students and teachers in Florida. Thank you. You guys, we're going to come, whoever's a participant, to do the bill signing. We'll uh, make it official.
All right. Well, thanks for um, uh, Jacksonville Classical Academy for hosting us. Really appreciate all the great work that you guys have done over these. I mean, how many years now has the school been open? This is the fourth year. Yeah. Um, I remember when it first opened. Um, that, was a, that was a big deal. So we're, uh, we're excited about it. And ultimately, the, the good thing about the way Florida approaches the education is we have, we encourage, of course, the parental choice. You can get a private scholarship, charter programs. Even a lot of school districts do a lot of choice programs within there. But you have a school like Jacksonville Classical Academy as a uh, charter school. They're not entitled to a single student. The only way they get students is if they're doing good and parents say, that's where I want my kids to go. So I think it creates good incentives uh, to, to, pr to provide good, good uh, instruction. And clearly, the fact that they've got a waiting list in every grade shows that they're doing a good job of that. OK, any questions? follows the student and the family. It, it's not embedded in a certain system or certain framework. And so the, the student and the family will be making those decisions. Even with robust choice, uh, you are still going to have huge enrollment through, through school districts. There's no question about that. I mean, we have 400,000 kids almost on private scholarship, almost 400,000 kids on, in public charters. Uh, but the balance, I mean, is, is you know, million, millions in, um, in, in school districts. And so, so that's going to continue to be an important part. Uh, this budget that I'm going to sign will have more funding per pupil for, uh, for school districts than we've ever had in the history of Florida. Uh, we'll also have an increase in the base student allocation and teacher salaries. So, so we view it all as important, but ultimately we want parents to be the one that are driving this by being able to choose the, the school that's best for them. And I think what you've seen in many parts of the state is the school districts have had to respond by, by offering programs that the parents uh, want. And, and, and they're really competing uh, to get students. So I think that's the, the best model. I think that's going to lead uh, to, to the best success. But I was never, you go back and look what I said when I first became governor when we did the Family Empowerment Scholarship. I was never anybody that said, I went to public school, um, graduated uh, from Dunedin High School over on the west coast of Florida. Um, I never said that, you know, you're going to do scholarships um, and, and then not do uh, public. Of course, there's, you're going to have that. And, and I want everyone to do well. Uh, but what's happened is parents have more agency over their kids' education today in Florida than they've ever had in state history, and that's a good thing. what will happen is even though that person is a parent in Clay County, they'll be able to challenge 12 books in Clay, Clay County, one a month, not overwhelming the system. And so this is designed, uh, like the governor mentioned before, to allow parents to have a say, allow parents to challenge books uh, that shouldn't be in a school. But anyone who creates a cottage industry of going around the state and just creating challenges just to gunk up the system and puts, uh, put this uh, – school systems at, in, in the rears as far as reviewing these books, that person won't be able to do it anymore because they'll have one challenge a month in the county they reside and, and they won't be able to, to challenge across the state like they're doing now. Well, I mean, and it's like, you know, just think about some of the nonsense that's happened. Um, they said um, that, oh, you know, you're not having uh, uh, Rosa Parks and yet that's on the summer reading list. 
uh, things about uh, Hank Aaron on, on Book of the Month from the Florida Department of Education. So that's clearly a bad faith challenge, just trying to create a narrative that, oh my gosh, you know, Florida doesn't have, uh, and I know there's some people that are willing to run with that, uh, but clearly there's, there's, there's no basis to support any of that. Uh, and so, so we think that's been totally unproductive. But some of those bad faith uh, uh, actions have been done from people within the school system who are doing that to try to create, create a narrative. So Manny will be able uh, to, to, to hold those folks accountable uh, because uh, clearly there's nothing in Florida law uh, that would tell you um, to do that. I also think on some of this stuff, it's just common sense. I mean, if somebody's challenging a book that's been that's been in schools for a long time, like, no, that's going to fail, right? Uh, that's just the reality. And it's not that a parent has a right to dictate the curriculum, uh, because they don't have a right to do that. That's why we elect people to school boards. That's why you elect people to, to state government, because we all have a role in setting that. Um, uh, but uh, when you're jamming some of this stuff in that's sexually explicit, a parent just shouldn't have to just be, you shouldn't tell the parent oh, that they have no recourse for that because that's wrong. That's just inappropriate. It's, it's inappropriate for whatever the, the young kid would be uh, in contact with at that point because I think most parents, 99% of parents don't think that that would be appropriate. But it also just shows that the whole system is off the rails if, if they think that is what they should be doing their time on uh, as administrators or educators to, to try to jam that in the curriculum. So, so that's important, but, but what it is, is it's very limited in terms of, terms of what we've done. So I think this goes a long way uh, to, to, to dealing with some of the bad faith actors that have, that have done, uh, and if there's, there's more that needs to be done administratively, if he has the authority, I know Manny will be willing to, to lean in on that. Well, I mean, I think, look, it's, it's, I think it benefits us to give people those options as a state, but we're really doing it because it benefits the students to be able to, to get through to acquire a degree as cheaply and as quickly as possible. Uh, not everyone necessarily wants to do that. I mean, you know, it used to kind of be uh, a joke, particularly for, for SEC schools, that maybe you stick around for that fifth football season and then you go out. Although I don't know the way, well, I won't, I won't. <laughs> I want to see us, I want to see us do well in college football again. I know Florida State had a good year until that last game. I know the, the Gators didn't do as good, uh, and, and Miami's not, but I mean, I'd like to get them all back. I think this whole N NIL may need some guardrails, and the transferring has gotten out of hand. Uh, you know, transferring once, fine, you shouldn't have to sit out, but to just treat it like a free agency where you don't know who's going to come back each year, I think that's diluted uh, college sports. Nevertheless, people used to say, hey, maybe I'll stick around, do another football year, uh, another football season. Well, uh, you have a lot of people that, that want to want to get going and they want to get out there. So to be able to be out earning income with no debt is very, very significant. We have, of course, with the Bright Futures program, if you're a, a top high school student, you pay zero tuition in, in, in Florida. Uh, if you're close to the top, you pay 25% of the tuition because it's a 75% uh, deal on that. That's as generous as anywhere in the country, especially given how low our tuition is. But that's the, one of the reasons why we've held the line on tuition because we want this to be attainable. And, and, and uh, Chancellor Rodriguez pointed out with tuition being the same that it was 10 years ago in Florida, in spite of all the inflation we've seen, this has been the most inflationary period that we've had in our economy. You've got to go back 40 years to be able to find something. Groceries, all these things that have gone up. And yet tuition at Florida public universities are the same uh, that they were before. That means students who work a summer job are going to be able to pay all their tuition and fees really without much of a problem because most of these students 
could make more than minimum wage given Florida's economy, uh, given all the stuff that, that, that's happened. There's a lot of, of interest, even though there's headwinds overall with, with the continuing the interest rates, the inflation that Washington's imposed upon us. There's a lot of opportunity. So you can do that, and you really don't have to go one penny in debt. I mean, if you're willing to work over the summer as a student, I think work during the school year, too. I mean, I did it. I think that that's attainable. You don't have to go into debt at all. That is a really, really big deal. And I do think taking out a student loan, you know, there's a role for that. Uh, if you're going to get a, you know, end up being a, an engineer from MIT, tuition's pretty expensive there, but you're probably going to be okay. Some of the people going to medical school or something, I, I understand that. And, and that should be available for folks. But to go from $200 billion a year in outstanding student debt to $1.6 trillion, that's not healthy. Uh, and that's been driven by, I think, a lot of bad policies. And so we have higher educations more attainable in Florida than anywhere. Now, as proud as we are of the state university system, universities aren't for, for everybody. We want uh, vocational education and workforce development, and we've done a whole host of things with that. So not only can you get college credit with dual enrollment, which will be expanding in Florida, and we want to do, you can get certifications in high school for electric, for HVAC, for, for these things. You have kids will get hired right out of high school and get be gainfully employed and, and do very well. So we believe that's a very good pathway. Uh, we've worked really hard with our state colleges to have programs that are responsive to the job markets, that students can get uh, skills there at a minimal cost and then go on and be productive. So, so I'm really, really appreciative of what we've been able to do, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, having people have to mortgage their entire life's future over some piece of paper is not the incentives you want to be creating. And I'm happy in Florida. That's not what we've done. Yes, sir. They do have an athletic director, and they do. And that's something we definitely support. We want to make it so that folks can, um, uh, can have those opportunities. You know, we've also kicked around different things, and I'm actually open to it. How they treat football or some of the, the, the coaches in high school in Florida compared to some of these others is different. It's more, um, I don't want to say that money's everything, but I think you can make more money being like a high school football coach in Georgia because you can have parents uh, can do, they can do boosters and stuff. And look, I know there's got to be guardrails on that, but I want it to be attractive to, to, to coach. I think that that's really important. And I think athletics plays a really, really important part, especially in a state where you can play sports. I mean, as a baseball player, I, I played year round as a kid. You can do that in Florida. Um, it's depressing when you would go, uh, I was up in New England and you get snowed out of a game in late March. That would not have happened in Florida. So we're very blessed that we have opportunities here uh, for that. And that's something that, that we want to do. And, and if you think about it, uh, we produce some of the best high school football players every year. We produce some of the best high school baseball players every year. Golf, uh, tremendous golf. Uh, we're doing now, I mean, we, we've done from where we were 20 years ago, women's soccer. Look at our programs at Florida State, some of those places. So there's a lot of really, really good stuff. But um, athletics is important. We're, we're, I'm going to be signing another bill that the legislature did to ensure that uh, certain patriotic organizations have access to campus. And some of the things that some of those organizations are things like Little League Baseball, that they can come, come to campus, that they can let uh, the students know and the parents know what's available in their community. So some of that, obviously, we want programs at the schools, but we also want to make sure that these community organizations that are doing good stuff, that people have the opportunities to be able to do. You know, there's a lot of different... When I was growing up, at least from the baseball perspective, it was, it was simple. You did whatever little league programs were. You know, there was a t-ball, then a slow of coach pitch, then you got into the main little league, then when you got out of there, you graduated the big field. You did it. Now they have these travel teams. They have this and that. I don't even I, – I, I asked some of my friends who were involved in professional baseball, they go, how do you make sense of this? Um, but there's travel ball. There's a lot of stuff that they're doing now 
that is, um, that, that is just different. So it used to be a little bit more cookie cutter. Now it seems like it's a little bit more specialized, but the more we can have options for kids uh, when they're particularly in, in elementary and middle school, uh, I think it's really, really important. So, well, listen, thanks, everybody. I'm really excited to be here, really excited to sign this piece of legislation, and keep up the good work. Thank you.